Uh, my name is Linda Hall. I'm one of the co-founders and president of Connected Community. <clears throat> we were founded in 2013 by four moms who wanted to build a better life for their own children with disabilities as well as others like them. Through our four areas of service, which are educational outreach, social and service opportunities, creative day services and employment, we strive to help families prepare for and navigate the transition out of educational entitlements and into what we hope will be a full and meaningful life in the community. I want to take a minute to introduce our CTC board members that are here today. Uh, Co-founder and director Barb Tobias is in the back taking pictures. Uh, Co-founder and director Mary Hansen is here someplace. There she is over on the side. Director Sandy Ricketts is checking people in at the door. Uh, director Judy Sinais who's doing double duty here with uh, the commission, and our employment specialist, Colleen Getz, who's also out at the registration table. Um, we're always looking for new people to get involved with Connected Community, so if you're interested in being on our board or volunteering in another way, we'd love to have you just reach out and we'll put you to work, I guarantee it. Um, I wanna recognize our two partners in this, uh, this event. First is the Village of Hoffman Estates and their commission for people with disabilities. The village allows us to use this beautiful room, which we really appreciate, and the commission generously provides our morning refreshments, tech support, videography, and more. So everybody who's here from the commission or other volunteers from the village, do you want to stand up and be recognized? I appreciate it. They're all hanging out over there somewhere. We put them to work, too. Our second event partner is NSSEO, the Northwest Suburban Special Education Organization. NSSEO has been a partner of Connected Community pretty much since day one, and we appreciate their support over the years. They print all of our seminar materials and they handle the registration and administration of uh, our continuing education credits for those professionals who are here today. So thank you so much, NSSEO. Um, and finally, we want to publicly thank Palatine Township, who generously helps us with our educational outreach initiative, funding our events, which include free monthly Friday forums and informational tours, as well as this annual transition summit. Their support allows us to keep our costs low so we can keep our events as accessible to people as possible. Uh, a few notes about today's format. Because we have a really tight agenda, we ask you to please hold your questions to the end of each presentation, and we'll get to as many as we can while still keeping on our agenda format. Um, in addition, in order to save time, behind your agenda in your event folders are the biographies for all of our speakers. Please take a look. Look at all the accomplishments that these people have. It's amazing. And it allows me to keep my introductions very short <laughs> and succinct. So take a look at those when you have a chance. Okay, so let's get started. Today's event is about housing. And like so many things in the disability world, it's not a one-size-fits-all proposition. What's an ideal housing situation for my son may be a disaster for yours, and vice versa. So today we're gonna start with an overview of kind of what different options are available in the state of Illinois, and then we're going to take kind of a deeper dive into some maybe more unique or things that you haven't really heard about before to give you some information that hopefully you can use. So while not every topic is going to apply to your family's situation, we hope that when you leave today you'll have at least some information that will help you in making you know, more decisions and getting your journey started to find the right housing fit for you. Our final speaker of the day is Miranda Martinicki from Community Alternatives Unlimited, CAU, to most of the people here, who will be talking about the new ISC Housing Navigator Pilot, which is designed to cultivate and pursue community-based independent housing options for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Miranda has over 15 years of experience working in the DD field, and she is excited to work with individuals to help them realize their dreams of living in the community and in her role as the CAU housing navigator. So please welcome Miranda. Hi, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Linda. Um, and thank you to everyone that made today's event possible. Um, I'm excited to tell you what I've learned so far um, in the first year of the housing navigation pilot. Uh, we're about eight months in, um, so we have a lot of learning still to do, um, but have learned a lot already along the way. So with that, all right, so you're probably wondering what is housing navigation. Um, it's a two-year pilot program 
that was launched in partnership by the Illinois Department of Human Services and the Illinois Council on Developmental Disabilities. Um, the goal is to assist individuals in finding safe, accessible locations to rent independently in the community. Um, right now, the primary activities um, of the ISC, Housing Navigator, are to assess and work with the individuals um, to identify housing preferences, needs, and desires. Um, so typically, when I open someone up to housing navigation, I'm doing a housing assessment to kind of figure out um, what these needs, desires are. Um, and that drives the process for us. Um, navigators, we also work to cultivate and maintain landlord and affordable housing relationships um, across various communities to facilitate making matches between independent housing options um, and individuals with developmental disabilities who have expressed a desire for independent and supported affordable housing. Um, right now, this is available to individuals who are currently receiving DD waiver services um, and those who have been recently selected from PUNS. Um, this could be inclusive of individuals who want to live either alone or with others of their choice, um, whether that be roommates, um, sometimes family members, a live-in aid. Uh, we can kind of you know, work with any of those types of situations. Um, right now, both DD waiver programs are eligible for housing navigation. Um, so we've had a lot of people talking about home-based. Um, home-based absolutely could be used um, as a supportive service for someone moving into an independent living situation, um, as well as SILA, um, whether that be intermittent SILA um, or even 24-hour supports, potentially. Um, so talk a little bit more about the assessments. Um, the housing navigator will work with you um, and the individual to identify housing preferences and needs. Um, and again, that could be as far as location or what type of supports the person needs to be successful in an independent type of living situation. Um, financial, and this is really key. Um, we would work with you, with the individual, to figure out a budget um, of what's going to be affordable so that, you know, again, they can be successful living in this type of situation. Uh, we also work on housing linkage. Um, so we have access to enroll individuals in the statewide referral network. Um, we utilize this pretty heavily, um, but that is not the only option for affordable housing out there. Um, and we can absolutely help individuals explore what some of those other subsidies might be, um, or even market rate. Um, there are some individuals who are you know, working part-time or even full-time who um, you know, may not be financially eligible for a statewide referral network or a subsidized type of unit. Um, so we can explore mar market rate as well within their budget. Um, and then of course, we're always looking for the right fit. Um, so once a location is identified that meets the known areas of importance, uh, we'll assist with pretty much the whole process, um, including touring, um, helping with applications, the moving process, um, as needed. So you know, I can kind of assist as much or as little um, as the person needs. Moving on. Um, and I think some of the other presenters have also expressed that this is a collaborative mission. Um, I definitely agree with that. This is a team effort 100% of the way um, between the person, their family, um, the ISC case manager, the housing navigator, as well as service providers of your choice. Um, so the housing navigator will remain in contact with your ISC throughout the transition. Uh, we'll also work with you to ensure that services and supports are in place for a seamless transition. Once the transition is completed, um, then the identified ISC will continue to work with the individual um, and make sure that they're satisfied with their living arrangements and the services that they're receiving. Um, and then housing navigation can always be reinitiated. Um, so, if, so for if some reason somebody wants to move to a new location or for whatever reason something just isn't working out, um, you can reopen your case with housing navigation and look for alternate options. All right, so as far as enrollment, um, how can someone that's interested enroll in housing navigation? 
Um, first step is always just to call or email your ISC um, for someone that already is in waiver service. Uh, you can just start with your ISA case manager and they would be able to link you to the housing navigator um, at your ISC. Ask for housing navigation um, and then you also would want to make sure that it's in the discovery and personal plan. Um, not necessarily as an outcome, but just as a service and support that the person is interested in. All right, and now I have a lot of frequently asked questions that have kind of come up along the way. Um, so first one we have is, I'm interested, but not quite ready to move yet. Um, so if you're looking to move anytime within like the next two or so years, um, you can absolutely start contacting the housing navigator um, to get the process started. You can start the assessment process. Um, and it also helps for future planning. Um, we're providing this information to DDD on a regular basis, um, and they are keeping track of individuals who maybe are not already looking actively for housing, but may want to in the future for planning purposes. Um, next question is, what if I want to move to a location that's not in my service area? Um, we can absolutely help you with that as well, um, pretty much within any location um, within Illinois. Um, I would encourage you to consult your housing navigator for how that would work. Um, right now, I believe seven of the nine ISEs are participating in the pilot program, um, and we're all kind of working together to, to make this work. Um, what if my income is too high um, to qualify for a statewide referral network? I touched upon this already a little bit, um, but we could explore other opportunities, whether that would be other subsidies or um, you know, even market rate options that may be within a doable budget. Um, as far as if this opportunity is available for a family seeking housing support, um, Possibly, it really depends on the individual situation. Um, we can help with rental opportunities only. Um, you know, so if you're looking to have assistance for purchasing a home, this would not um, be able to cover that. Um, and of course, the waivers cannot pay for housing. And then finally, are there any additional funds available? And the answer to that is yes. Um, there is a transition fund that's available on an as-needed basis to help with any moving costs. Um, and there is an assessment for that that could be completed if someone has a financial need that may be a barrier to them um, moving into supported housing. More questions and answers. Um, how will an individual with a disability that's living in a separate apartment in a regular building be supported? Do they need staff on site? Um, people receiving housing navigation assistance will also be matched with a service provider. So that's really key um, to have someone that is able to provide the supports to a person um, in their apartment so that they are successful. Typically, um, in these sites, there are not going to be staff there 24 seven. Um, some of them may provide an office space so that visiting staff can come in and meet with the individual. Um, but that is one of the features of this, that there is not going to be staff in that physical building. Um, if someone were to need a live-in staff, this is something that is a possibility, um, and that would be addressed during the referral process um, where we could indicate a need for a live-in aid. Um, as far as if there is an ongoing database that has properties posted, um, if there are openings at a location, that is not something that's available right now. I think that would be great if we did, um, but there isn't anything that's tracking vacancies and letting us know, um, you know, when, what type of availability is out there. Um, can the housing navigator pilot program be used for a small group, maybe two to three individuals who have been pulled from ponds um, and want a 24-hour SILA? Um, the very basic answer to that is possibly. Um, right now, this is intended for individuals who want to have you know, an independent lease um, and have separation of their housing from their service provider. So that's something that really kind of sets this apart from your traditional type of residential settings um, because the housing is going to be separate from the services that are provided. Um, individuals can choose to live together and jointly lease these apartments. 
um, and they can have either the same service provider or they can choose their own. So there could be multiple service providers working with different individuals in the units. Um, this also includes people who need 24-hour supports, and we are working with a handful of individuals who are you know, looking for more intensive supports um, in this type of setting. And a, pro uh, a provider-controlled 24-hour SILA um, within an apartment building where housing and services are under a rate um, is not covered by housing navigation. That would be separate. Facts continued. Um, as far as the SRN matching housing that's within the budget for individuals um, or considered the limited income, um, so this is kind of addressing Section 8. Um, sometimes SRN Section 811 is confused um, with HUD Section 8. Um, these are affordable types of housing um, and they're available to people that are at or below 30% of the area median income. Um, so it is intended for people who are you know, at very low income. Um, and then it also takes into consideration the household size. Um, and then there are some SRN units that may come with additional rental assistance um, that could further reduce the rent, um, maybe make it um, based more on that individual's income as opposed to area median income. So um, there are other ways to make this affordable for those who are interested. And again, SRN is not the same as Section 8, um, which would be like the project-based vouchers or housing choice vouchers that are managed by the public housing authorities in the different counties um, who can receive support from Housing Navigator program. Um, right now, this is going to support people who are assigned services for intellectual and developmental disabilities um, through the state of Illinois Medicaid waiver program. Um, again, this could be people who are newly selected from PUNS um, and are not yet in service, but actively working on that, um, or those who are already um, within waiver services. Um, and of course, we could help with transition funds, things like that as well. Um, if someone is on the PUNS and wants to get on the SRN, can an ISC do that for the person? Um, and at what age do you suggest registering? Um, so what you would want to do is make sure you know, the level of natural support that the person has available and what they would be comfortable with living in this type of setting. Um, the SRN is open to adding people who do not yet have Medicaid waiver services. Um, but again, you'd want to think, is someone going to be able to be successful in an independent setting without services in place? Um, the SRN right now is only accessed by someone at a service provider or an ISC. Um, it's not open to the public, um, and people not yet in waiver services will be alerted when there are opportunities um, for pair enrollment through housing navigation. That's just not something that we're addressing right now at this time. Okay. And then finally, to address the concern about the need for on-site staff, um, will funds be provided for remote support and access to 24-hour provider backup person? Um, this really depends on um, the services that the person chooses to receive, um, and there are funds that could be available for um, adaptations or remote supports um, technology, uh, depending on what the person's needs are. Uh, there are a couple of websites that you could follow um, to get a little bit more information about remote support, adaptive equipment, and assistive technology. And housing navigators facilitate access to an appropriate living situation in the community. Um, ISCs, ISA case managers work to secure a DD services provider um, that will work for the ongoing support. So we would work together throughout this process um, to make sure that there is a provider that's able to serve the person in this setting. Um, and then that would come together as the overall service package along with the housing. Um, apartment buildings typically have on-site property management. Um, and then oftentimes they also have on-site um, custodial staff or maintenance staff um, that are there to respond to any building related types of issues that may arise. Um, 
And it's important, again, for everyone to be able to work together. So that would be the individual, family, service providers, ISC, um, to document whatever type of assistive technology or other supports are going to be needed for someone um, to live in an apartment and so that they're supported in between visits you know, from their PSW or their SDA, ISC, all those acronyms we were talking about. Um, and that people can, and I have seen them, um, move into community settings and been very successful given the right supports. In conclusion, I think we'll get out of here a little bit early on this beautiful day. Um, so we at CAU are excited to be participating in this pilot. Um, it's been very exciting kind of learning about the different options that are out there. We have had a lot of um, interest already. Uh, we're getting referrals on an almost daily basis where we're enrolling people in the SRN um, and starting the housing search process for them. Um, just keep in mind this is a pilot, uh, so anything that was shared today um, you know, could be different in a few months. Everything is kind of being adjusted as we learn um, and gain experience and share our experience. Um, but we, we're happy to be able to um, help provide this information for emerging policies and procedures and um, excited to continue this. So thank you everyone um, for coming out today. And yes, we do have some time for questions. Because I have a question. So the, the Navigator pilot just started less than a year ago, right? So how, how are you finding it? Like how have, um, you know, building owners or apartment owners, have they been open to the conversations about rental units? How many people have you been working with? Success stories, struggles? I mean, obviously it's a pilot, so it's developing on the fly, right? Yeah, exactly. We are very much kind of learning as we go, um, which, which is great, um, but that also poses challenges as well. Um, we've had quite a few success stories. So um, recently had a couple of individuals move into their very first independent apartments. Um, they seem to be doing really well. Um, have also housed several individuals with live-in aids. Um, and I'm also working with some others who have already been living independently, but their current setting just isn't really working out. So we're trying to help them find something different. Um, it, we are running into some barriers. Um, it's been touched upon that staffing is an issue. Um, so that is also something to kind of keep in mind. Um, you know, we have seen that those who are able to be a little bit more independent, the process moves much more quickly just because they don't need that 24 hour staffing. Um, but we do have some that we have had providers um, you know, expressed interest and in their ability to serve them and those are you know, actively underway as well, just not finalized as far as moves just yet. It, it takes a little bit longer to get all of those different pieces in place um, to get the move moving forward. All right, questions? Yeah, my question is, what is what you think that it will happen after the, after the two year pilot is done? That is a great question. Uh, <laughs> well, I would, I would hope that after two years, the success of the pilot would enable us to continue this. At least in some way, shape, or form, whether that's informally or just you know, doing it formally as well. Hey, Miranda, you mentioned that you had, uh, were working with a handful of individuals who needed more intensive supports. Um, that needed like a one, would that be like a one to one in like a 24 hour SILA? Yes, we are actively working with a few individuals who either need a live-in aid or are looking for like 24-hour type of shift staff. But this would be still for a person that's more independent or someone that requires a high level of support? It could be available to someone who has a high level of support. Um, that's where we would want to have a more in-detail conversation rather um, with the whole team to figure out what type of supports are needed um, and if there is a provider that's able to um, meet those needs as well yeah. in this type of housing situation. But it is something that we're absolutely open to exploring um, and we are actively exploring that right now with a handful of individuals looking for that. Yeah, please bring that back to the table when you go back. Yeah, because yeah. even today it was mostly more for people that can live independently rather than the um, people who need a higher level of support um, on their day-to-day -day 
So maybe the next pilot could be for that. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> If we're already on the SRN, that doesn't necessarily mean we're in the pilot, correct? Not necessarily. Um, what I can say is for at least with CAU, um, we kind of have informally just started working with individuals whenever someone already in the SRN is matched. Um, so well, it's so not you have like- to be matched first? I mean, do you have to find a property? I, I get confused about the process. Yeah, absolutely. That would be the statewide referral network. Um, that's basically like a database um, that's accessible specifically to individuals who have n needs, um, not necessarily only people with DD, um, but our population that we work with are considered a priority population in the statewide referral network, um, and it's a way for them to get linked with subsidized housing options. Um, but to go back to your original question. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I gotta rethink it. <laughs> we're, we're already on the SRN, right? but I don't think we're in the pilot. Right, so um, basically when someone is in the SRN, they're waiting to be paired with units that are within the different preferences that they have. Um, a lot of times there may be needs for that specific unit that the person has, as well as like geographical preferences. Um, and then once there is a unit becomes available that might meet those needs, a person is what we call paired. Um, and then they are notified of the pairing. I'm the person who would be the contact at CAU whenever any of the pairings happen pretty much moving forward. Um, so we're kind of automatically doing that um, for anyone that was in the SRN prior to the pilot. So is the pilot just more like customized? Is that how you would differentiate it from like a year ago? Like what's new? What in the pilot is new of, as opposed to how it was a year ago? Right. Yeah, so it's a more active process, I would say. Um, I think before the pilot was in place, um, most of the time people would be notified and then we'd kind of give you the property manager information and say, okay, contact them, let us know if you need help. Um, now we have a dedicated person, that would be myself, um, that can help um, facilitate that entire referral process, application process, um, you know, help you out along the way. Um, there's also the transition fund that is something unique um, to this pilot that was not available before now. Um, and then we can also look to other types of housing. So you're not limited only to the statewide referral network. Right. I mean, is that customized too? Like, are you, I mean, you're just actively looking what else is out there, or are you looking for that specific person? Like, this would be a batch for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a combination. So it would be for that specific person. That's why any new person to navigation, um, we would do a housing assessment to kind of talk about different areas and needs. Um, and then I am also kind of actively trying to cultivate relationships with property managers and landlords so that they let me know sometimes when they have upcoming vacancies. Um, and then I can take that and kind of look at who we have looking in certain areas and notify the family or the individual about those options as well. So my question is, if you have someone who wants to be independent but not alone, can you pair people up to live in the same apartment or home? That's a great question and I've had quite a few families asking for that um, and the answer is yes, but it would be more on an informal basis. Um, but I do have like kind of a running list of individuals who are interested in certain areas um, and if they are open or wanting to have a roommate. Um, we could you know, share contact information to kind of link you, um, but that would then be something that the families would do independently of us to find out if it's a good match. I don't know if you covered it, but um, what areas do you cover? Or oh, that's a... That's a great question. Or are you all of <laughs> Illinois or just a certain area? 
Yeah, so CAU, um, we are considered Region B uh, within the state of Illinois. We have a pretty big service area. So we cover the northwest um, half of Chicago, the northwest half of Cook County, and then all of Lake County. Um, and then, like I said before, um, there are, I think, seven of the nine ISCs are also participating in the pilot. So if you're outside of that service area, um, you know, you probably will have a housing navigator if you're kind of within the Chicagoland area as well. Um, and you can just contact your ISC and they'd be able to put you in contact with the housing navigator in that location. So that was my question, Miranda. You are the housing navigator for CAU. Correct. And not everyone in this room may have you as the service provider. So could you just explain a little bit more about maybe who the others might be, those other seven that are involved in the pilot programs? Sure, yeah, I, I cannot remember all seven off the top of my head, um, but in this area, there's also Service Inc, who kind of covers like the DuPage, McHenry, um, Will County areas. There is also Suburban Access, and they cover Suburban Cook, um, the south half of that. Um, community service options that cover the south half of Chicago. Um, I believe Prairie Land um, that's in southern Illinois is also participating. Um, CISA and a couple others. And if we're not directly with you, CAU, or one of our service providers on the pilot program, what does that mean? Can we come to you? Possibly. Um, I, I don't want to say no to that. I think it really would depend on geography and just you know, how manageable that would be. Um, you know, if, if I'm here in Northern Illinois, being able to help someone in Southern Illinois, it may not be the best match, um, but I could certainly you know, kind of help troubleshoot and maybe link you to someone that is closer to the area that you're in. Or maybe just for today's presentation, if they contacted you, you'd be able to figure out their location or their service provider and do that with like Potentially, sure. Um, okay, so I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. Okay, so our ISC is, is Service Inc. We're up in McHenry County. So I would obviously reach out to them, but would I then end up speaking to you? I'm a little confused. Or does Service Inc. have their own navigator? Is, is, I'm trying to understand. Great, that's a great question. So um, no, Service Inc. has someone who's doing the same thing as me uh, for their region. So. I would say the best first step would just be to contact Service Inc., um, whether that's their intake line or if you have an ISA or ISC caseworker, and then they would be able to connect you with the housing navigator for your area. Any questions I missed? Oh, over here. So I'm a little confused, but <laughs> You said earlier that we couldn't use our waiver funding for this, for housing. Am I misunderstanding? I thought that that was how we were paying for some of this stuff. So how does it get paid for if we're not using waiver money? That's a great question. So the waiver itself cannot pay for like rent or anything like that. Um, the waiver would be providing the supports for the person in this setting. Um, and the way that it get paid for could be through subsidies. Um, that's where the statewide referral network kind of comes in. Um, and that's where we would also come up with maybe a budget for that individual person. So then how do you pay for it? I mean, like, if I'm planning on my person living in an apartment, she wouldn't be able to use her waiver funding, so she would need to look at a Zillow? No, not, not necessarily. And it, and it is a little bit confusing. Um, that's where the subsidy would come in, where the person would only be paying a percentage of their income. Their income being Social Security? Mm -hmm. yes. It absolutely can. Okay. okay. Yep. So, so we would have a home-based waiver. Right. So in hypothetically, someone could, let's say, be matched with a unit. They would be paying, let's say, 30% of their income, whether that's Social Security or a combination of Social Security and, let's say, income from a part-time job or something like that. Um, and then the waiver services would provide the self-direction assistance, the PSW, who would come in and then provide the support to the person in that apartment. 
but it would not be directly paying for that person's rent. That would come through the subsidy. Right. Any other questions? Right. Right, but it would still be calculated based on whatever that final combined amount is. Yeah, Then I have my own question. So you're not understanding how you, you would use the Social Security to pay your rent. Okay, say, yeah, I'll make up. So 30% so of that. Is what rent is. Okay. <laughs> right. okay, my question is different. I know there's a lot of waiting lists for rental properties. Right. So do you feel like, what would you consider an average of time to be for someone to be waiting for a rental? Okay. Yeah, that's another really good question and that it really varies um, I would say depending on location especially I've had some individuals that I've enrolled and they have got paired two days later uh, and then I have others that have been waiting honestly for years um, and so it just really depends on what you're looking for what the needs are if there you know are modifications needed if it needs to be accessible um, there are a lot of factors that kind of come into play that could contribute to the length of time that someone is waiting. But you're right, there are very long waiting lists um, pretty much for any type of subsidized housing right now. Um, and a lot of those wait lists are even closed. Um, so I mean, it's kind of like waiting to even get on the waiting list. Um, but that's where the SRN comes in, um, and that is different. Um, and that's a way where we are able to directly enroll someone for those wait lists. Anyone else have questions that I miss? Oh, I'll be right there. <laughs> so, like, I'm in Kane County. So the pilot program is statewide. Yes, it is. Okay, got it. That was I was thinking. Oh shoot. I'm not gonna, it's only for, what's on your, your first? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's just CAU service area. But if you're in Kane County, that would be Service Inc. Yes. Problem. Yeah, I think there might be confusion about a service provider and what the ISC is, which is the Independent Service Coordination Agency. The ISC is who you signed up for PONS, who you do different, it's not like a Clearbrook or a Little City. It's your ISC different, different ball game. Does everybody understand that or no? So I mean, if you live in this area, CAU is your ISC, but you may be getting self-determined, you know, other services through a Clearbrook or a Little City or whoever. But the ISC is who you meet with quarterly, do your goals and your personal plan and all that kind of, that's who is running the housing navigator pilot. Right. Thank you, Linda. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, the service <laughs> provider thing gets a little murky sometimes. Do anybody else have any Independent Service Coordination Agency. It took over Mary's job. I don't know. It's I just wanted to make sure that I understood something correctly. Um, we had been pulled from the au paired um, probably before you were on board with a pilot. So, and it, it turned out to not be a good match. I'd put that area in and it, it, it just wouldn't work with my son's job. At that point, now that there's a pilot, is there anything else that you would do? I mean, is it maybe that we originally put the incorrect suburbs in? I mean, is that? Do you do more than just once there's a pairing, work with someone, or would there have been any benefit if this pilot had already started? Because I felt like I just, it was wrong and we just let it go. Sure, so as I'm understanding, so your son is already in the statewide referral right. network. And he's been and has been paired. twice for the same okay. building, which 
it's just not a good right, fit. It sounds like put it in carefully at the beginning, but I think that was pre you. That was before the pilot. Okay. Um, yeah, so at least how I've been doing it at CAU is um, annually there is a certification that we do just to make sure that all the information in the statewide referral network is still accurate. Um, so when that comes due, that's an opportunity to kind of change some of those preferences, whether those be for the unit itself or geographical preferences. Um, or at any time, you can contact um, the ISC and I would be happy to help adjust those preferences at any time so that you're getting more accurate matches. Um, and just another kind of aside to piggyback on that, if someone does decline a unit, it's not like they're going to be penalized for that. Um, it's just, you know, again, not knowing how long it may be until the next pairing happens. Um, but I've seen people be paired for multiple units um, and that doesn't seem to affect their eligibility. Anybody else have any more questions? I'm not missing anybody? Okay, well thank you Miranda for coming. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. <laughs>